All right, so this is Todd Atkins, and I'm here with Miguel Adorati. It's been a little bit since we did an MMA Conspiracy Hour. But uh, today with the 1FC signing of uh, Takira Segawa, uh, which is kind of a big deal, we're going to kind of talk about the signing and also what it means for 1FC, and we're going to get into a little bit of PFL Bellator talk and some other things. And as always, before we start, I want you to check out uh, Live to Fight, um, which is our sponsor. The promo code is Todd Atkins. If you order a banner for a fighter or a gym, you get 20% off when you use it. And they're the sponsor of all of my content and the show. So, Miguel, I kind of want to let, let you take it away. This was a big news, you know, for Japanese fans, obviously, hardcore fans that know who he is. You know, the average American fan may not, obviously, but kind of talk about what you think about the signing for one. You know, there's also on on state side. There's the rumor that one is preparing, and and actually their their CEO uh, said that they're working on an offer for Francis Ngannou as well. And I think that you know that is one of the things that make one strategy something to watch is that they do have a little bit of a multifaceted approach. Signing the UFC's heavyweight champion is very intriguing in a situation where. You know, now they've signed one of the top draw kickboxers in Japan. They really haven't done much shows in Japan. They've stayed in other areas of Asia. You know, at some point, maybe they appear back in Tokyo, and that would be big for them. So I think that they're the only company that we're going to talk about that I think um, has some of the same assets at the UFC at certain levels. I, I think they'll fall short, but I think right now that they um, – the, the the ultimate goal there is if you're going to compete with the UFC is to is to be able to distribute weekly fights and and I think that that's something that one may have the capability of doing um you know because right now they're still on smaller contracts right but to sign this guy like there's not many fighters left in combat sports and if they are they're more from like our era who have competed in front of 60,000 people you know, Takira is one of the few that's around. We still got a couple from our era that have done that, but not many. So when you got a guy who can draw like that, if you go to Japan, it's huge. Right, and even if you don't, if you bring him in. You know, you, you bring him in as a challenge to your Muay Thai guy. I assume it would be kickboxing, and um, again, and that's the other interesting part that when you hold up one to the UFC, of course, I think the UFC is ahead. You know of the curve in many aspects and one may never catch them. But here's a, a thing where you got to give one credit. They went to Muay Thai and they went to Billy grappling to present it on the same stage as their MMA. And um, the UFC gave a slapstick. And by slapstick, he means power slap. This is his uh, favorite moniker. Now, I'm kind of the one who I always want to see somebody follow up a, a home run with another one. So how big would it be for them to get Francis Ngannou after having the signing? You know, I, I was thinking about this, and now this is the conspiracy part. So, you know, you look at it, and we've talked about this on multiple occasions, that really Tyson Fury is Ngannou's big fight. Deontay Wilder is, you know, in the ball game for something – that would qualify as a big fight, but it's a notch below the Tyson Fury fight. And that one of the problems with Francis is that really the only other opponent that comes to mind for, especially for the, you know, worldwide audience is John Jones again. So at some point you might wind up back to the UFC. And where does one play in? You know, if you look at one's MMA roster, um, I believe their champion is at like 12 and 0 and he's Russian. But that's, you know, an anonymous fighter in terms of an American audience. And, you know, that's not going to be, you know, the one champion doesn't carry enough weight to make that a crossover big fight. So, yeah, Ngannou could join that roster and head into their heavyweight division and rule it probably for the, the next many years. One's got a different style of doing contracts. They usually do it, but they may have him. On a six-fight deal, where they'll deliver the six fights in, you know, 27 months, 
to a little, they usually won't do just two years, they'll extend it a little bit or something like that. So who knows if that's the way, but you also know that, you know, Matt Hume is there and that Hume is a guy with philosophy uh, behind the uh, MMA side where, you know, they're trying to get, um, you know, to the end end game. And I think that it was, he would be the person that uh, allowed them to do Muay Thai or asked to do Muay Thai or pushed to do Muay Thai and then pushed to do grappling as well and presenting it at a high level. That I think Hume's an integral part of that. So now the wheels start rolling. And what if I threw Ryan Gordon, who's on the one roster? Gordon Ryan. As in Gordon, Ryan. Gordon Ryan. Ryan Gordon. Gordon Ryan. <laughs> but uh, what if I threw Gordon Ryan's name in the hat as in Ghana's next opponent? And you now you give it a full six months of build up. I think that's a fight that would attract amazing amounts of attention. And at the end of the day, it's a 21st century version of the classic grappler versus striker. It's an interesting theory. I mean, <laughs> you really, I mean, I could see why they would want to do it. I just don't know if Gordon Ryan would want to do it. You know, Gordon Ryan will, it doesn't want to do it cheap. And who could blame him? He's already what, but you know, the that's that's the idea to me is that the grapplers um can distinguish themselves and be grapplers the in you know champions, even under the one structure, be the champions for a long time. And you know, maybe back in the day we would have seen Marcelo Garcia hold that belt and that sort of stuff. Yeah, you know, they could have had a real legit superstar. These guys they have now. Are heading in that direction, you know, um, the Rotolo uh, twins and things like that. And uh, you know, Gordon's a guy they signed. They he has some type of contractual agreement with them, but there was never, you know, he's not competed or anything like that. But at the end of the day, the grappling is probably going to have a much lower pay scale than the MMA, and the MMA will also present them the ability to say, "Well, we can pay you more for this type of challenge." And against Ngannou. You got, you know, for for example, I happen to know, like I know on the Muay Thai side that the pay scale is lower than MMA now on a worldwide level and that their offers were, you know, a, around there. So it's not huge money being tossed around on the side sports. I think that may be preserved for the MMA and they present MMA as their central platform. So if Ryan was, you know, basically got a signing bonus and they wanted to unleash him in his MMA debut against Ngannou, like I said, the classic, yeah, he's, he's a smaller, but he's very strong. He's got a wrestling that's also unusual in that he gets people down pretty consistently. And he's commonly called him like, he's obviously going to have to go to MMA to grab, you know, take, but he's going to have to learn enough to not get his head taken off. And I think it becomes something that, that, that to me, would be a fascinating matchup. And I think that that would have a lot of appeal to, you know, to Joe Rogan's, the Eddie Bravo's, like, you know, everybody would have to pay attention to that, even the influence in this sport, even though it's not a UFC fight. And, um, you know, I, other than that, I'm not interested in seeing Ngannou against their best Russian or anything like that. And not that I'm not interested, but I don't think that they as a company can count on that fight to be the fight that breaks them through to, 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 to the audience that they need to get to. Uh, Gordon Ryan and Ngannou might have a chance at that. And like I've said on this podcast a couple of times, that's a short list. Gordon Ryan just got himself on it because he's the Michael Jordan of grappling. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really... In How important is it, though, with all these... With the eyes on 1FC now, since they made this big signing, to follow it up with Ngannou? Well, we know they've, they've approached Ngannou and that the exchange is there. Do they get the job done? I think part of it is, do they have an opponent? Do they have a strategy? And so we'll see. Like I said, it becomes a lot less interesting and a lot less marketable if they just slip them into their heavyweight division and, you know, recycle Brandon Vera to fight him the first time. I, you know, what, what can there's not many huge names on their division, especially when it comes to social media impact in the States. And if they're going to present in the States, you know, I think um, 
you know, it, it also depends. Why bring in Ganu and, and anybody to Asia to do that? So it may be part of their strategy to go to Europe or to back to the States. They're planning a show for August. So um, could that bring us an uh, Ngannou appearance? That may be where they're planning to, to unveil him if they do get the signing. It's just who's the opponent going to be? Because the only interesting one I can think of that's within the realm of possibility is Gordon Ryan. Now, one, one thing I just thought of just now, you know how you see promotions like Dave Feldman saying, oh, we made Ngannou an offer. You wanted too much money. Or now one saying, we're talking to him. Is it good to say, well, we're talking to some guy and then ultimately not sign him? Doesn't that look bad? You know, at this point, you know, Feldman has a number in his head before he, the conversations happen. You know, one has made a decision on how much they're willing to spend in order to make it happen. If it's going to be more than that, at some point there will be a line that they're going to have to jump off of. Even Dana, you know, whatever the motivations were there, Dana wasn't going to overpay for none. I don't know where that magical value comes from, but it comes from knowing what your deals are, where you're going to distribute, who the opponent is, and how big you can make a fight. So just signing Nganu and just, you know, uh, with the Japanese signing, there's the thought that, you know, Rogue Tang probably wins in, in Denver, and then that's the next opponent. You know, and if it were in Tokyo, even bigger and better. But you don't have that with Nganu because their champions are more anonymous uh, to the worldwide audience in the heavyweight division. And what one's always been, in my eyes, also a, a highlight uh, place for smaller weight classes. Their heavyweights have never been their bread and butter. Yeah, but what I mean is, you know, you, you've been a matchmaker for hundreds of shows. You've obviously you've been around promoters. What is the value in saying you're talking to some? Is there a value in saying you're talking to someone and then not getting them? I guess from just, uh, just from a publicity standpoint. But when you're a yeah, successful it, promotion, doesn't it also look bad to ultimately not close? I, I think it's a case by case basis. I, I think what you're what you're trying to say, you know, one is going to always come at you um, that they're already the UFC's peers. I'm not sure that's the case. You know, you, we, there's a lot to analyze there. Um, they can make the best case, and you know, we move on to talk about PFL and Bellator. Even a combination of those companies can't make that case. You know, one's, um, you know. Like I said, I don't think at this point the UFC is like, oh, you know, one's coming. You know, I don't think they're that worried because they've got so much structure, distribution, and things that they're going to be hard to go up against. But one seems to be wanting to try it with, you know, a more concerted effort, and they've been taking their time to do it. You know, it makes a big difference. Pride, even Pride, came to the United States around their 30th show, and it was because they were dying and they wanted to, go out with a bang or try to make it look like they were still healthy and pulling off big things. One is coming over here with a pedigree of several hundred shows. So, you know, and a lot of international experience, it makes a difference. They've run shows in the Philippines and Malaysia and Singapore. And, you know, every one of those is logistically something that gives the company maturity. So coming to the States, yeah, I think they'll be able to pull it off. We'll see how the show looks and everything. It's in Denver. Um, you know, how the boxing commission there is going to react to their rule set and their weight cutting situation. That's something that, you know, I haven't heard in public any anybody, not the boxing commission, anybody worried about that. But I'd like to ask them, but, you know, they don't seem to be out in public doing a huge amount of publicity. So, We'll see. I think they want to get the first one under their belts. Yeah, and that's something that's interesting that you bring up. They don't really, outside of like Chatri going on the MMA hour, there really isn't a lot of publicity that one engages with, at least with the American audience. It's almost like right. he's, for example, I'm a big fan of Alabama football. Nick Saban doesn't let his other coaches speak to the media. 
it almost seems like Chaudhry doesn't let anyone talk to the media or and he doesn't really that talk be, to the media much. And that may be and that may be and and um that's where he defers from Dana. Because Dana, you know, was an entity with the media almost right away. And, you know, with his brash nature or whatever you want to call it, especially from the early days on, he never backed off. Like we said, you know, at some point in the 2018 or, you know, around there, or maybe it was COVID or whatever, it was like, but we talked about it. They made news. They didn't go to a UFC. That means he'd probably been to 10 years worth almost every single show every week. So yeah, you know, if, if that's who you're going to take on and you're going to approach them with less energy, you know, the, the odds start to slant. Yeah. Now I want to kind of talk a little bit about the PFL Bell Tour rumor, which I kind of put out there. I want to know what you think about it. First of all, I compliment you as a journalist, reporter, internet shit talker, whatever you want to call yourself. But um, I think uh, it's a good catch because, you know, one of the things that you notice is even if you made it up, it's not like there's a groundswell of people saying you're wrong. And there are, you know, other hints that this could have been in the works before and even now. So my hat's off to you for, you know, stirring the pot a little in the conversation. But I'll tell you one thing that did not happen. Even if they buy it, and it does happen, and the PFL and Bellator are together, I'll tell you one thing that will not happen, and that's that Vince McMahon runs on the phone to call the UFC people and be like, what are we going to do? It's so beneath them that they, they don't even care. And I think that the PFL and Bellator may have good intentions, but sometimes mergers can be attritive too. They can be a problem. And so they're going into new territory. That may be what they think they're going, you know, what will get them to the next level. But um, I don't think this, this merger is as strong as it could have been if it was, you know, 10 years ago, if the IFL had merged with Elite XC. You know, that would have been more of a threat to the UFC at that time point. But they're too much of a monster now. It all comes down to, this is another theme. I, I, if, if you're facing the UFC, it comes down to what Dana did is he always, you know, they went from Spike TV and then they had their pay-per-views. And then when, you know, they graduated from Spike, they've been on a gamut of channels. There were all the deals, I believe, with NBC or CBS. And, you know, they had major ground channels and Fox, another channel. And then Fox also had their... Um, cable entities where I think you know uh, they were on Fox Sports which is a cable entity and then when they do a special show it would be on Fox the, the ground channel channel 5 in New York you know and then after that they've got the ESPN deals and ESPN does the same thing offers them ESPN Latino in South America ESPN 1, 2, 3, 4 they can do fights all the time and they can do weekly so if Bellator takes their TV deal they have with one channel and combines it with the PFL deal where they have, and they have to figure it out. Either they keep two channels, which probably won't be the case. They're going to choose, select one, and then their schedule will be subject to the schedule of the TV stations. And that means that they will never threaten the UFC in any way. You know, thinking about it, it would almost be better for one to buy Bellator, because at least they could inject their roster into theirs, you know, and it would give them more depth, you know, now yeah, that they're coming it, over here. But yeah, you know, that at some point it would be like I said, one one I don't know. I, I think they could confront the uh UFC on a couple of fronts. Like for example, um, you know, if I was their executive, I would harp on the purity of the sport. Um, I've seen uh, one report where he's, they've done math and that metrics that they like to do in the modern era. And the UFC's fights that we see, about 40% of them finish. 
Everything else goes to decision. So more, more than half the fights go to decision, and one's finish rate is about 70%. And I, I think that that's their most powerful way to assault them is through the purity of the sport. Also, we do grappling and Muay Thai while they do power slap. It's very indicting. It's very indicting for the people that really understand sport in, in that purest way. The people that watch the Olympics and, and follow the athlete because they're watching what they do. So one that's one's most threatening position is that at the end of the day, Dana saying he loves the sport is starting to look very hollow now. Because really, you know, you can love money and the sport, but right now it's really only looking like he loves money and the sport not so much. That's okay. I mean, he's old at this point too. But I think that's their strongest attack on the UFC is the purity. And then the fact is, is when Dana goes away, if one sustains in 20 years, they might be bigger than the UFC. It might be something that you see over a long haul. I, I don't trust even the PFL Bellator merger to be around that long after. Now, I I want to touch on something else that I saw come up, which was ADCC announced that they're going back to flow grappling. They were originally going to be on Fight Pass for this next, you know, they had signed a deal with Fight Pass. They were going to, the 2024 um, tournament was going to be on Fight Pass. And the reasoning is that UFC doesn't have the technology or the capability to do multi-map filming. I want to hear your take on this. So we never saw them film two rooms at Tough. Isn't there one training room and another training room? And sometimes they're they're doing cardio here while the other guys are doing grappling, but they, they can't handle that. I you know, I I, I I've seen where their TV crews for the big fights visit gyms and interview several people. Well, they're doing multiple shoots all the time, so it makes no sense. Sounds like BS to me. And if they wanted, like I said, the original Abu Dhabis in the 2000s were filmed with $50,000 in equipment, but we managed to get all the mats filmed. So to tell me you can't film all the mats is, is a hollow excuse that they want to back out of the deal with Abu Dhabi. And so I, I can't tell you all the history. At one point in the UFC's history, under the Fertitas, uh, the story went that the, they were cash poor, that they needed a cash influx, and that they sold a 10% stake in the UFC to the sheiks from Abu Dhabi. And it's from there that the relationship begins, and you get Fight Island later because, they, you know, we know that there, there is a passion for the sport over there as well, and also deep pockets. And, and, and they have their reasons for doing things. So if you're pulling out of that relationship with uh, Abu Dhabi in some way, shape, or form, maybe it's a small time move. Maybe it's a sign that we won't see them at Fight Island anymore. Um, so I do think it's interesting that way because if the whole, that whole, if, you know, if it's the same Sheik still in charge of his grappling and things like that and he feels a little affronted, they won't, they won't be able to go back to Fight Island that easily. It's and, not the yeah. same people, you know, it's, it's not the same people, but yeah, my but question you know, is, you are, it's not the same people and it's not Sheik Taknoon, but right. is it his brother? Is it his cousin? It's still royal family. And uh, in terms of power in the country, they also have a certain way they have to carry themselves in terms of the populace. They cannot be seen to be disrespected either. And that, that believe it or not, carries an incredible amount of weight or could carry an incredible amount of weight. At the end of the day, if it comes down to contracts and they're pulling out for this, out of the other reasons, the lawyers figure it out, they may just break up and you'll see it on Flow Grappling. I don't know how much you can read into it, but that's a conspiracy is that if somebody's pissed off over there, they might lose access to Fight Island or might not be able to rely on it as often as they do now. But So you think UFC backed out of the deals, what you think? I, I, I don't know for sure. Maybe, maybe you know, maybe they're just weary, you know? Maybe the guy who's in charge of taping and stuff like that pissed Dana off last week and Dana ain't giving him shit for a budget. So, uh, you know, there's just too many factors. I don't know for sure. But um, to me, when you hear Abu Dhabi, you understand that you're going there, that 
the, the, there's a royal family. That's the government of the country. That there's factions in the royal family that are passionate about jujitsu and have been since they were young. So they've carried it their whole lives. So it's not like they're not, they're just doing it for the money. No, there is a passion on the part of some of them for the sport. There's also a passion for making Abu Dhabi bigger and international and better and things like that. So they've got a lot of things that they worry about. Bringing fights in is supposed to be a good thing. Now it breaks up. If they break up and look bad, it could have some repercussions on relationships there. That's all I'm saying. Not, you know, move on. We just see it on Flow Grappling. Still the greatest tournament in the world. Now, another thing kind of along those lines was this this news that the Figueredo versus Manal cop fight was off for UC 290, I believe. And it was they had already announced the fight is done. You know, they had already put out that it's going to be on the card. But Figueredo was not even cleared to fight. So now it's come out that he can't take the fight. So these little things that you would think the biggest organization in the world could have, you know, control over, does it, do they not? Or is, it's kind of like a bad look, don't you think? You know... The uh, NBA, every once in a while, I had to deal with, you know, players getting offended by fans and they've even had fights, you know. But there, there's a lot of exchanges every once in a while where, you know, players get fans thrown out of the building, you know, and, you know, sometimes players, you know, in many cases accuse fans of racism and stuff like that. They can't, you can't control absolutely everything. And this is, I think, just because, now the UFC is basically at weekly shows and they are a league with 800 athletes or, you know, 600 athletes on the roster. You can't control everything on a lower level. When we used to run events, you know, in the early two thousands come fight week, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, everybody's all hands on deck. You've got the crew, the fighters, the cornermen, everybody's there. You've got a few days to manage. And we always used to say, from here to the show, at least three things are going to go wrong. Fights canceled, this, that, the other thing, whatever it is, three things will go wrong. Sure, as the UFC becomes a corporation, that's what they look to eliminate, those little problems. And they manage that really, really well. And this is just an example of, at this size, they just can't hit it 100%. But, you know, I... It, it would be more suspect that they were pushing a Connor fight or a John Jones fight and then had to yank it for whatever reason. Maybe we'll see that Connor, you know, that, that happens with Connor, and that would be big news. But Figueredo, he's not a huge draw. So it's not like the, the, the motivation for it isn't there. It's It looks like just a fuck up. The, you know, excuse my friend, it looks like just a, you know, a hiccup. And, uh, you know, that's something they did deliberate. With the, what would be deliberate? We'll roll Figueredo out there to sell the tickets and then, you know, we'll pull the bait and switch. I don't think it was that. I think it's just sloppy. It's because, you know, there have been a few of those things. They, the, the chief executive shouldn't be found, you know, on video slapping his wife around. So, you know, and also investing in something that's not a sport that, you know, to many people looks bad. Yeah, you you know, when Dana's there, and you know, Dana's a force of nature. Who's going to tell him to his face that he's wrong or that this is stupid? And if they do, he just poo-poos and moves on anyway. He doesn't give a shit if you're have a different opinion than him. He does what he wants. But he looks really bad in this. So, yeah, it looks like there have been little, little things like that. Maybe a little chink in the armor every once in a while. At the end of the day, Dana's old at this point. He's, you know, getting to be 50, 50 in his 50s. And, uh... You know, you just don't have the same energy as when you were 30 and doing this. So and he doesn't give a shit anymore. It's clear, you know. You know, now that you bring it up, I do want to ask you about this. Conor McGregor, you know, Chael Sonnen said, he came out and said he doesn't think the fight's going to happen with Chandler. And then McGregor may not fight in the UFC again, for that matter. You know, there's no sign that he's in the USADA pool. You know, which he, he probably needed to be if they were going to do the fight at MSG you know, around the time that they were wanting to. What do you make of that? See, this is where you can intertwine things. Because um, at one point, maybe even now, 
the UFC could just do it on Fight Island. Over there, they won't be subject. They, they, they can make it happen. Hmm. Or, or some other exotic location kind of thing, you know? So, and you saw it at the end of the day, you know, the UFC supposedly pays for their roster to do it or encourages their whole roster to do it. But at the end of the day, in um, boxing, it's voluntary. You know, and you, we know Dana, probably Dana's of the opinion that they should just let fighters roid and do everything. And, I, you know, the... I don't think that he's necessarily wrong in that aspect. But now when there's a USADA pro problem or anything like this, he refers you to other people he don't even want to deal with. So, yeah. And, and, and the problem is, is whoever's dealing with it, if it, that dealing with it turns out to be Connor doesn't fight, then yeah, you're, you're going to have a Dana that's pissed off in upper management and stuff because that's a cash cow that you just stabbed out. At right, but when, day, when you have these plans that don't come off, it kind of looks like UFC is losing it a little bit. Do you, do you agree, or am I making too much out of it? No, I think you're making the, and here's why. Because, I, I, okay, let me let me caveat that because you're not wrong in that it would be a debacle if something happened and McGregor walked away and never fought again, or fought elsewhere under a different banner and not with the UFC. Total problem because he's their biggest draw. But you know what will happen is the fight was scheduled for X date. It doesn't happen. But some other fight will be there that day. And then the next week there's another one. And then the next week there's another one. And then the next week there's another one. And again, and you understand what I'm saying. You tell me when was the last Bellator event. How much space between Bellator events. Right. You know, the PFL runs a tournament, so they're very compacted. They run over like a season. But then because of the TV season, they want to show something else for three months. All their roster sits. That's why it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But the UFC will white. What, that's what they've done with everything. Go back when John Jones got arrested. When John Jones ran over a pregnant woman, when you know when the when those debacles were happening, what happened? They just press forward, and got to you know Stipe and stuff like that, and they let John sit. They move, but they always had something else to present, so that you don't have you. We have more to talk about than just that situation, and that's what will happen with Connor if that happens. It'll be a blip on the radar, a big one. Albeit, but it'll be a blip on the radar and they will move on making news. Yeah, of course. They have to move on. But it is kind of like, you know, you make this announcement. We're gonna Michael Chandler and Connor McGregor in tough season. They're gonna fight after. Whoops, we can't get our biggest star in the in the cage. Never mind. You know, it's kind of embarrassing. It, the other problem here though, I think, is I think a lot of people will blame Connor. And it's just it, it it's a symptom of him just having made enough money at this point that it's it's hard to corral him and hard to make him do something you don't want to do. You know that that f u money term it comes from the point where no matter what money we throw at you or no matter what we you have enough that you could, could walk away you don't need to deal with anybody's BS. And I think that that kind of really believes that in himself too. There's ego there and things like that, and he thinks. That these companies, these bureaucrats are going to just kowtow. Now, we'll see if they have the, you know, if, if, if they back it up, the, uh, you know, the the USADA and the VEDA or, you know, whatever those commissions are. And how much they back it up and if they try to do that. That's precisely what they've never done. It's to actually, this is, this is actually the problem with the whole system to me is, that, you know, no matter what happens, it seems like because there's a big fight and big money that the commissions will work with you to make it happen. Well, Miguel, I think that, 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 I'm sorry. Keep in mind, the commissions are USADA, but mm -hmm. there is an intertwining there where USADA has been playing along for a few years now. You know, 
all these low level guys that get arrested, you know, get busted for steroids and stuff. You don't get the high level guys. Why would that be? Because they probably have better doctors, better uh, programs. They catch the little guys and then every once in a while to bolster the numbers so they could say, you know, we had 800 fights this year and we had 17 suspensions for a percentage of 3.4%. And this resulted in this much fines and this much income. And, you know, to that, they sneak in there those terrible pot suspensions. That's how they've sustained themselves this whole time. Hasn't been an impressive run for you, USADA. So, the trust they're going to be the buffoons here and i think what will happen is the ufc will be able to make them the buffoon and if they have to they have connor to be a scapegoat too because you know if you can't control connor hey you can't control connor i they will come out and say something cold like i tried to talk to him but you can't get through to him he's not gonna he and he can do whatever he wants he has enough money and that'll be the end of it yeah, I think that's something interesting to leave on. It's a, you know, as always, Miguel, I want to thank you for taking time to do this. And for everybody who enjoys the MMA Conspiracy Hour, you'll be seeing more of us always. And uh, until next time. Shout out to Mike Brown. If you're still watching, send me a Facebook message that you saw it. Yeah, if shout not, out to I'm Mike Brown for sure. Call you out on watching it, Mikey. <laughs> and I still owe you 50 bucks. So. <laughs> All right, Miguel, it was great talking to you. Until next time, everybody, take care.